This video was brought to you by Indently.io, learning Python made simple. How's it going everyone? In today's video, we're going to be covering 10 incredibly useful ways that you can use the underscore in Python. Starting with the first one, which I will always regard to as an Easter egg because I never use the Python console. But in case you do use the Python console, you can use the underscore in a very interesting way. So here I have the Python console opened up and I'm going to add 10 plus 10. And we're going to get a value such as 20. So what the underscore does in the Python console is use the last value. So the underscore here is going to be considered 20. So underscore plus 10 is going to give us 30 as an output. But we can also do something such as create a variable called x and just print x. And that's also going to be considered the last value. So now we can type in underscore plus, let's say, Bob. And that's because I used a multiplication symbol there. So let's try that again. Underscore plus Bob. And it's going to use the last value and append Bob to that value. So in the console, it can be used for quick maths. Moving on to use case number two, snake case. In a lot of programming languages, we have different conventions when it comes to naming variables. In Java, you'd probably use camel case, such as car something. If you have a class or whatever, if it's a variable, it might even start with a lowercase. And then for each new word, you would use an uppercase character. Sorry about my creativity here. It's early in the morning, so I'm doing my best. But anyway, in Python, we would not use this convention. You might see it around somewhere. If someone comes from JavaScript, they're probably going to do this in Python, but something much more conventional is snake case. So car something with an underscore. And for a better example, we would have something more like long list if we had some sort of long list. Or if you have a long variable name, you would separate those words using an underscore. So long var name. Use case number three. When you are dealing with big numbers in Python, it can become super easy to lose track of how many zeros you're using or how many digits you're using. And in any case that you are required to hard code this, it would be nice to have some sort of indication of how many zeros there actually are. So one thing we can do is create a variable called big number of type integer. And if you want to create a number with maybe let's say 12 zeros, you can use an underscore as a sign for the thousands, or it doesn't have to be for the thousands. You can actually place it anywhere in your number. I think the only rule is that you can't have them directly after each other, but otherwise between each number, you can put an underscore. And if you were to print this big number, those underscores will be ignored. They're just there as a visual sign for the developer to understand what the number actually is. So in Europe, you will see numbers being separated by the thousands like this. And I find that much more readable than this over here, because this requires you to actually read with maybe your mouse pointer or with your brain or with your eyes, whatever, this entire number, which can be quite difficult if you are looking at it. You might actually just have to type in something such as billion, and this is not a billion, I think this is a trillion. I'm really bad with these big numbers, but Thanks to the underscore, I can at least understand how many zeros there actually are. Up next, we have use case number four, which is using the underscore for unimportant values. For example, imagine we have a tuple called stats of type string, string, and integer, which just means that the tuple contains a string, a string, and an integer. And we want to extract values from this tuple, but we don't consider all these values to actually be important. Well, one thing we can do, of course, is unpack it by typing in name, underscore for the middle value, which we do not care about, which is the job and the age, because all we want to extract is the age and the name. Well, here we can use that underscore to perform the duty of telling the developer that that value just isn't important. And then we can assign stats to it. And thanks to this, we can print both the name and the age, and it will work just fine. As you can see, name contains Bob and the age contains the age, which is 27. It's important to note that the underscore is a valid variable name, which means it will contain the value of programmer. But conventionally, you would not use it for anything. It's supposed to be something you ignore. 
because maybe later throughout the program, you might assign it a different value. It's just there to tell the developer that this value is unimportant. Use case number five, star underscore. Here I'm going to create a variable called values, which will be of type list of integer, and it will contain five values. And once again, we want to unpack the values, but this time we only want to grab the first value and the last value of this iterable. So I'm going to create a tuple or an unpacking operation here using first the variable name of first, then I'm going to use star underscore for the middle and last at the end. Then we can type in that's going to equal values. And now we can print the first and the last and the separator is going to be set to this underscore. So that when we run this, what you should notice is that we were able to grab the first variable and the last variable while this absorbed everything in the middle. And if we were to print the underscore, you'll see it's going to contain the other values. And that's all this does. This absorbs everything in between. Use case number six, for loops. In some cases, you're not going to care about the variable name of what you're iterating through in a for loop. For example, here we can type in four underscore in range, let's say three, and four came out of course, we're going to print for loop. As you can see, we're not using this underscore anywhere inside our for loop because we don't really care about that value. All we care about is that we are iterating through this three times. And if we were to run this, you'll see that it will print for loop three times. Otherwise, this also works in list comprehensions. So let's get rid of that. And here we're going to print yo for underscore in range three. And the same thing applies here. We're not using this value that comes from the range. So there's no point in actually giving it a name. Of course, you can change this to I if you want or to whatever you want, but we're not going to be using this value. So it's not necessary. You can explicitly tell the developer that this value does not matter, that we just care about iterating through this three times and doing this operation. If we were to run this, we would get yo, yo, yo. Use case number seven, semi-private variables. And for this example, I'm going to import from UUID, UUID4 and the UUID type. Because what I want to do next is create a class called lamp. And all it's going to take inside the initializer is a brand. So self.brand is going to equal whatever brand we insert and each lamp is going to contain an ID, but we want this information to be exclusive to each one of the classes and its subclasses. We don't want the developer to use this information outside of the class. So one thing that we can do, which is merely a naming convention, is use the underscore to define it as a semi-private variable. For example, here we can type in self dot underscore ID and that will be of type UUID, which will equal a UUID4. So each time we create a lamp, it gives it an ID. And then below, we'll create a method called getID, which returns a UUID, and we will return self.underscoreID. So anyone using our program should be using this get method. They should never access this directly as we defined in the class. Otherwise, if you also have, let's say, a subclass called sublamp, this should also be a fine place to use that ID, as long as it's within the class or the subclass. For example, here we can have something called sub lamp method, and that's going to return none, but it's going to print, let's say, self dot underscore ID. That should still be fine because we're using it inside the lamp or its subclass. What's not fine is using it directly outside of the class. So if we create an instance of this class and I'm going to do it directly inside the print statement and the class is going to have the brand of Bob, we can still refer to the ID outside and it's going to work just fine. It's going to grab that ID. But if you ever do this outside of a class, it should come to you as a huge red flag that it was not supposed to be accessed this way whoever created or designed the class meant for it to only be used internally inside the class or the subclass. So it's merely a naming convention that tells you that if you happen to see it around in other code bases. Use case number eight, name mangling, name mangling, name mangling, name mangling. I'm drinking coffee now. Use case number eight, name mangling. Once again, we're going to be using the same class as from the previous example. 
except this time we're going to use name mangling for our ID. So here I'm going to type in self dot underscore underscore hidden ID. And that's going to equal a UUID4, except this time the double underscore is going to give us some special functionality. And to demonstrate that, I'm going to create a lamp called Pam, which is my favorite brand. I don't know if it exists or not, but if it does, it's my favorite brand. And what I'm going to do after that is print the brand. And if we were to run this, it should work just fine. We should get the brand of the lamp printed to the console. But now watch what happens if we try to print the hidden ID. So I'm just going to copy that and paste it in here you'll notice that this does not exist. We're going to get an attribute error because what we told Python with the double underscore is to mangle this name, which just means it changed this name slightly at runtime so that it could potentially help with name clashes. Now, just because we mangled this doesn't mean we can't access it. Nothing is ever going to be private in Python. As far as I know, maybe there will be a new update, but as far as I know today, there's nothing that you can make private in Python. And actually, if we were to go back to the console, or let's go to number four, and number four is the shortcut that takes me to my console, just to clear that up. If we were to go back here and read the attribute error, it's actually going to tell you what we should have referred to, which is actually the mangled name. So as you can see by convention, it just puts the class name in front of the hidden ID variable or whatever the variable is. So to access that, that's what we need to insert not the double dot though, although that would be a cool uh, mechanism. And if we were to run this, it would work this time, even if we get a lot of ugly squiggly lines, both from MyPy that doesn't know this exists and from whatever this is going to be, also doesn't know it exists. And name mangling is a whole topic on its own. M coding has a really good video on this. So I'll just search that in on YouTube if you're curious about how to use it properly. But to sum this up, it just mangles the name at runtime, which can potentially help with name collisions. Up next, we have use case number nine, Dunder methods. And for this example, I'm going to import the self type from the typing module. And I'm going to create a class called custom number, which takes a value. And inside the initializer, we just assign the value to the instance of the class. And then with this, I'm going to create two custom numbers. And immediately, I'm just going to print one of these numbers, which is going to be number one. And what we should get as an output in the console is this weird custom object at this memory address, which isn't that useful in terms of information. So what Dunder methods allow us to do is to override built in functionality for these types. For example, right now, if we were to add these two together, we would get an error because we don't have any code defined to handle this operation, n1 plus n2. So what we can do is type in def double underscore add, which will take self and other. And other preferably is going to be this custom number. So I'm going to refer to it as self. It can actually be any, so it's not restricted to self, but I use self because I like to get the context actions from custom number in other. And this will return to us an integer. And what we're going to do here is create an insane operation. In general, you should just add the numbers such as self.value plus other.value. As you can see, I'm getting those context actions and return that. That would make the most sense for the custom number. But I'm going to do this times 1 million. And I already messed up that trick. So that the next time we actually try to add these numbers together, we will get the result of that operation. It actually works because we defined that functionality as a Dunder method. Otherwise, Let's go back to what we had earlier, where I only printed n1. As you can see, we get this ugly representation that doesn't tell us anything as a human being or that a human being can understand. So what we're going to do instead is remove add because we're not going to use that ever again. And we're going to define a representation method, which will return to us a string. And here we're going to return that the custom number inside parentheses has a value that equals self.value. So that the next time we print our class, the representation is going to look like this, something that's easy to read. Otherwise, one more example of a Dunder method can be something such as the or Dunder method, which allows you to use the pipeline with your custom classes. So now we can do n1, 
and two. And when we run this, we will get whatever kind of functionality we put inside here. And there are a lot of Dunder methods to explore. So just type in double underscore method or just double underscore and scroll. Well, I'm not getting anything here. So def double underscore and scroll. Moving on to use case number 10, reserved names. In some occasions, you're going to want to use a name that's reserved by the system, such as class or for. And you're going to want to assign some sort of value to that, whatever that value may be. Unfortunately, you cannot do this because it's a reserved keyword. So one convention for reserved keywords is to add an underscore to them. So class and for. And that just helps you get around that problem. And I'm going to change this to Bob as well. Although, of course, you can change it to something more descriptive, such as classroom, if that's what it's supposed to be. Or for can just be for, I don't know, present destination. Although that's an incredibly long name. So I really prefer having for there. But yeah, it helps you use those reserved keywords as variable names. And finally, call me a dirty liar, but I actually included 11 ways to use the underscore in this video. So if you feel like dropping a like, drop a like if you enjoyed this video. Otherwise, don't drop a like. I'm not good at saying that. I honestly hate asking for likes. So do what you want. Leave a comment. Say hello to Bob. But uh, let's move on to number 11. So here we have something called gangster weather. And gangster weather is just the weather in gangster form. So in today's weather, it's raining. And what we're going to be using here is a match statement, which is great for pattern matching, but it, you can also use it to simulate an if else block. In some cases, if you find it cleaner, it wasn't made for that, but you can. And what we're going to do is cover a few cases. So if the gangster weather is equal to the case of rain, then we will print that yo, find yourself an umbrella. Otherwise, if the case is equal to sunny, we will print yo, put on that sunscreen. And finally, if there's any other kind of weather, which we did not cover, we can define that using an underscore as a wildcard. And that just tells the match statement that if there's anything that's not covered by these two cases, we're just going to default to this case. So it's just a default block, which prints, I have no idea, yo, ask Bob. And this block here, you can just consider to be the else block in an if else statement. So if we were to run this, you would get yo find yourself an umbrella as an output because the gangster weather is set to rain. But if you type in something such as thunder, which obviously was not covered by any of the cases, it's going to default to asking weatherman Bob. But yeah, those were the 11 most important use cases for underscores in Python. Do let me know what you think about this video in the comment section down below, whether you know of any other use cases which I missed in the video. But, uh, but yeah, now I'm actually speaking a lot. So as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.